There's a passage where the Buddha is going to teach meditation to his son. And he starts out by having the son take a survey of the different sensations he has in his body. In Pali they're called dhatu. There are potentials that you have in the body. There's a potential for energy, movement. There's a potential for heat. There's a potential for water, coolness. There's a potential for solidity and a potential for space. Where do you feel those things right now? Now in those days they believed that these are actually the elements from which the body was made. And at the very least we can look at them as the elements from which our sensation or our experience of the body is made. And then you look at the world outside and it's the same sort of thing. There's energy, heat, coolness, solidity, space. The same sorts of things. And they said, try to make your mind like Earth. People throw garbage on the earth and the earth doesn't shrink away. They can pour perfume on the earth and the earth doesn't get gladdened by it. Same with water, fire, wind. You can use water to wash dirt away and the water doesn't complain. You can use fire to burn trash, it doesn't complain. Wind can blow trash around, it doesn't complain. Now, if the instructions ended right there, it would be a lesson in equanimity, saying that that's all you have to do, just be with things. This is what trash is like. This is what perfume is like. It's like this. But the Buddha doesn't stop there. He then goes on and gives instructions in mindfulness of breathing. And there he recommends that you actually get proactive. You start out by looking at Short breathing and long breathing. Notice when the breath is short, notice when it's long. And then he says to train yourself. In fact, all the remaining steps in breath meditation are trainings. You're going to be doing something. This particular instance, the first thing you're going to do is to try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. The other passages where the Buddha gives analogies for the state of mind you're trying to develop. When you're working on mindfulness, he says you're trying to work on how to get the mind into concentration. We're not just here to be noting things coming and going. We're directing the mind in the right direction. Because after all, the path includes right concentration. You can't do without it. And in the analogies he gives for right concentration, the first one is of a bathman who takes some water and a bath powder. Back in those days they would make a kind of dough that you would rub over your body. And so like making bread, you take flour, mix it with water, and you try to get it so that the flour is all moistened. There's no dry patch here or there. But at the same time, the, the dough doesn't drip. In the same way, he says, when you focus the mind and get it concentrated, there should be a sense of ease, a sense of refreshment. And you allow that to seep through the body. And John Lee's recommendations come in handy here. He talks about the breath flowing through the different parts of the body, starting at the back of the neck, going down the spine, then out the legs, going down the shoulders, out the arms, starting at the middle of the chest, right around the heart, and going down through the different organs of the torso, down to the lower intestines. Think of the energy moving around in those areas and picking up whatever sense of ease there is as you focus on the breath and letting it spread. So you're not just sitting here seeing things and saying, well, that's the way it is. It's like this. If the breath is uncomfortable, it doesn't have to be like this. You can change. You can think of different ways of breathing. Nobody's here forcing you to breathe in a way that's uncomfortable, so why do it? You can change. And the Buddha encourages you. Some of the later steps you're trying to, he says, to breathe in a way that gives rise to that sense of refreshment, gives rise to a sense of ease and pleasure. So the whole purpose in the beginning to get the mind to be non-reactive is not to keep it there. 
is to get so that you're observant. When the mind is still like that and unreactive, then you can be in a better position to judge what's going to be comfortable and what's not, what's working and what's not. And if things aren't working, you don't get upset. You don't berate yourself for being a bad meditator. You just notice, okay, that's the way things are right now, but they don't have to be that way. What other way could they be? This is where you explore. And as you maintain that whole body awareness, and any sense of ease or refreshment comes up, you let it spread. Now, some people find the whole body a little bit too big to deal with in the beginning. So you can focus on one spot, get that one spot comfortable, and then go through the body section by section, breathing in a way that feels comfortable for that particular section of the body. You start around the navel, come up the front of the body, over the head, down the back down the shoulders, out the arms. Go around and around like this, section by section. And then you get a sense that you can connect all the different sections. So they all feel like they're breathing together, coming in, going out, with a sense of ease, a sense of harmony. That leads to the fourth step, which is to breathe in and out, calming what the Buddha calls bodily fabrication which is another term for the in-and-out breath. The reason he uses that term is because he wants you to notice the extent to which you are actually shaping the breath through your intentions, and how you can calm those intentions down. In the beginning, John Lee recommends deep, long breathing to energize the body. Because if you start out and just think, well, I'm just going to calm things down, you can put yourself to sleep. So energize yourself first, then think of calming things down. How do you calm things down? You don't suppress the breath. You're trying to make the mind as quiet as you can, as still as you can. And think of all the different breath energies in the body connecting up. And now you have a clear sense that the breath isn't coming in from outside, it's actually something from within the body itself. The touch of the breath, say, at the nose, that's a tactile sensation. That's the air coming in. But when the Buddha classifies the in and out breath, he doesn't classify it as a tactile sensation. He, tacks, <clears throat> he classifies it as the property of part of the energy property, the wind property in the body. It also classifies it as a kind of fabrication, something you shape through your intentions. So it actually comes from within the energy. When you feel that clearly, then you realize okay, you can make the energy full in the body. And the more that's a sense of a full energy and the mind is still, the calmer the breathing becomes. And as long as you're fully alert, there's nothing to fear if the breath stops, because you're not suppressing it. It's just that the body has its energy needs, and its energy needs are filled. If it has any need to breathe in, it will. But if you can stay with the breath very, very still. It's like tuning in a radio station. You tune it in so that there's no static, and then you can hear the message, whatever the message is on that station, very clearly. In the same way, when the breath energy is in the body are very still, you can see the movements of the mind very clearly, and that's what we're here for. Breath is like a thread that you follow through a maze to get to the mind in the middle. When it gets still, the mind becomes more and more clear, and you can see its movements. Here again, that practice you had in being non-reactive is going to be skillful. It's going to come in useful. Because you see, there are lots of things going on in the mind. There's a lot of chatter. Even when the mind is fairly still, there's going to be a little bit of chatter around the edges. 
And it's going to be saying good things. It's going to be saying stupid things, relevant things, irrelevant things. And you want to notice, what are the things that the mind picks up on and runs with and when it drops the breath? And why does it choose those things? When everything is very still, you're going to see this clearly. That's when you come to understand the mind. Because there's that big question in the mind. Why is it that we all want happiness, we all want well-being, and yet so many of the things we do for the sake of well-being end up creating something else? pain, suffering, stress. And the Buddha's answer is because we're not fully aware of what we're doing. We don't see it in these terms of what we're doing that's causing stress and what we're doing or what we could do to, to put an end to that stress. That requires that you step out of the different thought worlds you have and look at them as patterns of cause and effect, events leading to other events. Sometimes skillful, sometimes not. When you can see why the mind picks up on things that it really shouldn't be picking up on, and you're not blown away by that fact, you simply see it as a fact. And you see that you don't have to do it. It becomes that simple. Here again, that lesson in being non-reactive is going to be useful. Because all too often you see something you don't like inside yourself, you either deny it, or you tell yourself, well, maybe it's not so bad after all. Or maybe that's just the way I am. But if the way you are is causing you suffering, why hold on to it? It's a lot easier to simply note the fact, okay, this particular action is causing stress, and I don't have to do it. Being matter-of-fact in this way is really useful in the meditation. So those preliminary instructions that Buddha gave, and noticing there are things there, pleasant and unpleasant, and you don't have to react. But you're in a better position to see more and more clearly what you have to do with things that are pleasant and unpleasant, rather than just simply going through your old knee-jerk reactions. So they're not there just to tell you don't do anything at all, and that constitutes awakening. They're saying, well, really look carefully. Don't be too quick to react. Don't be too quick to come to a judgment about things. And you'll see things you didn't see before, and you'll be able to do things you didn't do before. As things get clearer and clearer in the mind. So that's the role of non-reactivity. It's not the goal. It's one of the mental skills you want to develop as part of a whole range of skills that you're going to need. That you're going to need. When you know how to use it correctly, then it can do a lot for you.